Hello and welcome to The Postcard Professor, where we take complex ideas and explain them in the space of a postcard. In this video, we're going to be using our knowledge of heat exchangers in order to perform a simple design example. Now, this is a design problem because we're going to know what we want our heat exchanger to do, and we're going to figure out what some of the parameters of that heat exchanger need to be. So the first criterion that our heat exchanger is going to fulfill is it is going to cool water from 95 degrees Celsius to 70 degrees Celsius. And it's going to do that at a mass flow rate of 0 0.1 kilograms per second. The coolant that we have at hand is going to be at a temperature coming in of 20 degrees Celsius. And we're going to be pumping it in at a mass flow rate of 0 0.25 kilograms per second. So these are our basic criteria. Let's talk about the basic parameters that we're going to start with for our design. We are only going to look at a two pipe heat exchanger. And the way that these work is that we have an exterior pipe, which is going to allow one of our fluids to flow. And that's going to surround an interior pipe. For this example, we're going to put our hot fluid in the middle. And we already know that that has a mass flow rate of m dot h, and our temperature there is going to be at thn. The mass flow rate is going to be the same out, but now our temperature is going to be th out. Likewise, our cold fluid is going to be on the outside pipe. It's going to have a mass flow rate of m dot c, an inlet temperature of tcn, and it's going to have an outlet temperature of tc out. Furthermore, we're going to choose the diameters of these pipes. So the inner pipe is going to be thin walled. So we're going to assume that D in is about the same as D out. And it's going to have a diameter of one inch or right at 2.54 centimeters. Our outer pipe is going to have a diameter of 1.5 inches. This doesn't actually play into our analysis today but I did use these values in order to calculate the heat transfer coefficients due to convection. So I'm including both of those if you're interested in uh, trying to duplicate my results. So there are two questions that are still unanswered about this heat exchanger. The first of which is, what is the temperature that our coolant is leaving at, right? We don't know how hot this is going to be. Secondly, and this is the bigger one, how long will this heat exchanger need to be to perform as we want it to? We can define all these other parameters and choose those, but we still need to rectify our vision of a heat exchanger with the reality of what we need from our criteria. And so the rest of this video is essentially going to be answering this question. How long does our heat exchanger need to be in order to do what we need it to do? So to start off answering those questions, we first need to figure out what this outlet temperature is going to be. We start with the heat transfer rate that causes this temperature difference. That's going to be this mass flow rate of our hot fluid multiplied by the specific heat of our hot fluid multiplied by the delta T. Now we're talking about water here, so we're going to say that our specific heat is right at 4180 joules per kilogram Kelvin. Plugging in our M dot, our specific heat, and our delta T of 25 Kelvin, we end up with a Q dot of 10.5 kilowatts. Now our coolant is also going to have a specific heat, and we're going to set that value to 2,500 joules per kilogram Kelvin. And with that value, we can now write that same equation for the cold side. Now we are going to make an assumption here. And that assumption is that there's no heat loss through our outer pipe wall. So we're going to say that this pipe is well insulated on the outside. We can rearrange this in order to find our TC out, which is going to be our TC in plus this Q dot value divided by M dot times of C, our M dot of our coolant times the specific heat of our coolant. And plugging in our values there, we end up with a TC out which is 36.7 degrees Celsius. We have all of our temperatures. Now that we got them, we can go ahead and find the temperature difference 
between the hot and the cold fluid. The reason we need all four is because that value is actually going to change over the pipe's length. Now we could just use an arithmetic mean or an average. It's actually more accurate to use the log mean temperature difference. And so that's going to be the difference on the outlet side minus the difference on the inlet side divided by the natural log of the ratio of those two temperature differences. Plugging those values in, our outlet side difference is going to be 70 minus 36.7, which is 33.3 Kelvin. Our inlet temperature difference is 95 minus 20, or 75 Kelvin. And we can plug those values in again in our denominator. Plugging it in, we end up with 51.3 Kelvin. So this is our log mean temperature difference. With that, we can go and use another equation for a Q dot. And this is the Q dot looking at the actual heat transfer based on the thermal resistance between the two fluids. So we look at an overall heat transfer coefficient multiplied by area, multiplied by this log mean temperature difference. Now, personally, I prefer to think of things in terms of a thermal resistance. So this UA term is the same thing as one over the total thermal resistance. And from that, we can actually solve for our, for our tote. It will be 51.3 Kelvin divided by that Q dot of 10.5 kilowatts, which ends up as 0.00491 Kelvin per watt. This is going to be a key piece in determining how long our heat exchanger needs to be. But to get to the next piece, we need to figure out another way of calculating our tote. And we can go there by zooming into our pipe wall. So looking a little closer here, our pipe has two surfaces. It has the surface touching the hot water and the surface touching the cold coolant. In addition, though, we're going to have some film of some chemicals that are deposited on our pipe wall, also known as chemical fouling. So we need to account for those as well. Now we already said that we're talking about a thin walled pipe here, which means that our conduction through the pipe wall, we're going to assume is approximately zero. We don't need to think about that thermal resistance. What we do need to think about is the convection heat transfer from the hot side, and we can set our H to 700 watts per meter squared Kelvin. We need to think about our heat transfer rate on our cold side, which is 1300 watts per meter squared Kelvin. And then finally, we need some information about this fouling. And we're gonna say that our interior and exterior fouling factors are both going to be 0 0.0002. The units here are meter squared Kelvin per watt. So that gets us all the way from the hot side to the cold side, neglecting that heat transfer through the pipe. So our total thermal resistance is going to be 1 over Hn times our area plus this fouling factor on the interior divided by our area plus the same thing for the exterior and then finally the convective resistance on the exterior. So the first thing you should notice is that each of these terms has an A in the denominator. So we can simplify this substantially just by taking out that A. Then we end up with 1 over 700 plus 0 0.000. I can add both these together to get 4 plus 1 over 1300. And then we'll have a good value for our total resistance. It'll be 1 over A times 0 0.00260. Kelvin meter squared per, per watt. And we're leaving that meter squared there because we have this area term in the denominator to cancel it out. So now we have two ways of looking at our total thermal resistance. We can use these two in order to calculate this area. And so our area here is just going to be our value here divided by the resistance that we know from our other equation. 
So this Kelvin over Watts cancels out in both the numerator and denominator, and we end up with a value of 0 0.529 meters squared. Well, for a cylinder, we know that our surface area is just going to be equal to pi times the diameter times the length. We know that our diameter is this 2.54 centimeters, and so we can calculate our length as 6.63 meters. And this right here is our final answer. Now, let's say that this is too long. What can we do? One thing that we could do is change some of our initial choices, right? If we, for instance, increased our mass flow rate, that would drop our outlet temperature, which would increase this delta T LM. Or we could do other things to influence this. We could also drop this temperature. That would increase this delta T as well. Both of those would decrease the total amount of area that we would need. Other things that we could do is increase the diameter of our pipes. That would allow us to increase the area without increasing the length. The problem you run into is that you also start changing your interior and exterior heat transfer rates. So if you do change those diameters, you'll need to recalculate these values. You could also try changing the direction of flow through one of these pipes, and that would cause you to have a counterflow heat exchanger. It's possible for that to have a large effect on your delta T log mean. However, in this case, it only changes it by a few degrees. Probably the best thing to do is to use a better base design for your heat exchanger. In a future example, we'll look at something called a tube in shell heat exchanger, which allows you to bend this pipe and get more surface area in a smaller total space. In any case, I hope this was helpful and gave you a first taste of what it actually looks like to design a heat exchanger uh, to meet some known criteria.